Hello everyone and welcome to lecture today. Um, today we're going to start by discussing uh, some more um, basic differential geometry of curves and um, see a couple different applications of, the, of this um, as we kind of delve deeper into the differential geometry of curves in 3D space. And you'll recall that we left off um, having uh, discussed a number of different topics, but we, uh, one of the main things we defined and introduced was the so-called Frenet frame, or Fren Frenet triplet. These are three vectors, the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector, the unit normal vector, and the binormal vector. This triplet is sometimes called the fundamental trihedron and basically can be defined at any point along a, along any curve so recall that if we have a parametric curve in three-dimensional space what we're saying is that at any point on the curve say this point right here or this point right here we can uniquely define the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector for the curve the unit normal vector to the curve and the binormal vector to the curve, which is perpendicular to the original tangent vector and normal vector. Um, in certain texts, in certain uh, you know applications, uh, we, we term what's called this plane right here. So we term that the, the plane that's spanned by the tangent and normal vector the oscillating plane. So this, this oscillating plane is smelt, spelt as uh, and this uh, is sometimes a very useful idea for discussing the differential geometry of curves. So you can kind of think of the tangent vector as going along the curve and then as the tangent vector goes along the curve um, and the curve possibly twists and turns uh, the oscillating plane will rotate as uh, the curve twists and turns um, and today we're going to try to understand this a little bit more in depth and see how we can kind of apply this as well in various different scenarios so what we'll look at first is a visualization um, of this plane for a very special example it's a little bit complex 
Um, so uh, we'll need to first describe where this parametric curve is coming from. We'll consider the following example. R of t is equal to, and we'll say the x component is going to be cosine of omega t times r plus r cosine of alpha t sine of omega t times r plus r cosine of alpha t and then lastly r times sine alpha t. And we will plot this out for t from 0 to 4 pi. So to help us out, we'll open up the GeoGebra plot, the Ge GeoGebra plot of this curve. And I've also plotted on the GeoGebra plot um, the, you know, a nice visualization here of the tangent plane and then the, um, the, the tangent vector, the unit tangent vector, the, the unit normal vector, and the, the unit binormal vector. Um, this curve has a number of different sliders to it that um, each correspond to one of the parameters in the curve. Uh, but as you can see, we'll play this animation. As you move along this curve right here, you end up getting that the tangent vector, the, the normal vector, and the binormal vector all behave um, exactly as we predicted they would uh, based on the, the last lecture. And if we go through, we can even show the oscillating plane if we want to, and how that changes as we go through this, this process. So you see the oscillating plane, the plane that goes along the normal vector and the tangent vector oscillates as such as um, you move around this, um, uh, th th this curve. This is a very, very kind of cool diagram. Um, you see that if you, you, we have a number of different controls over the different parameters here and changing these parameters like alpha and omega um, end up giving us um, slightly different um, forms for our parametric curve. And some of these forms will actually, can hopefully actually help you see a little bit uh, where this parametric curve is actually coming from. If we move this over a little bit, we can see this a little bit better. I'll give you a second to kind of guess where it's coming from. It might help if I maybe make this big R right here a little bit bigger. This should hopefully help you see a little bit better where this parametric curve is, is coming from. Um, so we'll increase alpha a little bit. And then increase omega a little bit. So this parametric curve is directly coming from the surface of a torus. If we plot the surface of the torus with this parametric curve, we can see very, very clearly that this curve is um, essentially mapping to the top of the surface, um, no matter what the value of alpha or omega is. And the value of alpha and omega is actually giving you, in some sense, then the number of rotations um, or the, the frequency of rotations around um, the, both the large circle of the torus and the small circle of the torus. And so this is what the, these, these things are controlling. And you can see uh, that very, very clearly, I think. So this is a very, very cool example. And um, 
you know, we, we can use this uh, for all different values of R. You can shrink R to a very small value, make big R very large, uh, make the, the, the smaller radius parameter very, very small or very, very large, depending, and you'll get a different curve each time. But the, the point here is that we can clearly see that um, the tangent vector, the binormal vector, and the normal vector are all acting like they should. And um, what we want to do is kind of get a, a better understanding of exactly how these, these vectors are related to one another. So we'll start with the, the simplest relation, and that was actually with the definition of curvature. So. Um, First off, uh, we're going to assume, just for um, uh, ease of calculation's sake, that we have a curve that is parameterized by arc length. So assume that R of S is a curve parameterized by arc length. S. So we have a number of different nice computational simplifications which come with that. Um, specifically, you know, one of the very nice computational simplifications is that um, we don't have to worry too much about some arbitrary parameterization t. And um, one of the big nice ones is that uh, our prime, which is the derivative with respect to s is just equal to the unit tangent vector. This is probably the, the fundamental um, thing of it, the fundamental uh, piece of importance here. If you don't uh, remember why that is, uh, it has a simple explanation. I mentioned this last lecture. The main idea is that, um, remember that the velocity is defined as magnitude of itself times this unit tangent vector, where uh, the unit tangent vector is just the unit vector pointing in the direction of the velocity. Um, but recall that this just means that this is Velocity vector is the same thing as dr dt. Which in terms of the s derivative is, or the arc length derivative is ds dt dr ds. And we proved by the definition of arc length last lecture that ds dt is in fact equal to the magnitude of the velocity. Right, these are the same thing. Therefore, in this vector expression, these two things cancel out, the two scalars, and we are left with the fact that the unit tangent vector is in fact equal to the derivative of position with respect to arc length. This is a big, big thing for us and is one point of very, very nice simplification. The other simplification that we have is that last lecture we defined what's called the curvature. In this case, we'll just deal with curvature as a function of arc length. The definition of this last lecture was that curvature is the magnitude of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length, or the total amount the unit tangent vector is changing with respect to changing position on the curve. Um, and this is uh, a very, very intuitive, nice idea for arc length and why um, it's, it's why this is the natural definition for arc length. So what this means then, and we know we recall that um, dt ds, the vector dt ds, 
was uh, used to define the, the unit normal vector. If you remember the definition of the unit normal vector, the unit normal vector was defined as the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length divided by the magnitude of this derivative. And therefore, so by the definition of curvature, the magnitude of the, the derivative of the unit tangent vector is going to be 1 over the curvature as a function of s. And so therefore, if we just multiply both sides of this expression by the curvature as a function of s, we have that um, an altern alternative description for the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length is the curvature function multiplied by the unit normal vector. And this is actually called the first Fresnay formula. We have three separate Fresnay formulas. This one uh, is going to be number one because this is giving us a fundamental relationship between the rate of change of one of uh, these vectors in the Fresnay triplet, the Fresnay frame, uh, and the, 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 the vector itself along with the, the curvature. For the next Fresnay uh, formula, we're going to have um, the following the following uh, thing to think about. We want to think of uh, how is the binormal vector changing along the curve. And um, this is actually going to lead us to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, another relatively simplified formula similar to one up here. Uh, what we want to do is take the derivative of this vector b. is the best way to find the rate of change of the binormal vector as we move through the frame. So to do this we have to remember the definition of b. b hat was defined as the cross product of the unit tangent vector with the unit normal vector, the curve. So the rate of change of the vector b, or dbds, is the rate of change of the binormal vector with respect to arc length is the, the s derivative of the cross product of t hat and n hat and we uh, you know showed last lecture a um, the property of the derivative of the cross product it follows the normal product rule um, so this is going to be dt hat ds cross n hat plus t hat cross dn hat ds. This is just the product rule applied to the cross product. And using what we know well, in some sense, we already know what this is going to be because dt hat ds, the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length, is really just the definition of uh, kappa times the normal vector. This is kappa, the curvature, times the normal vector, cross product with the normal vector. So this first term right here is going to be zero.
and then that leaves that the the derivative of the binormal vector with respect to arc length the rate of change of the binormal vector as you move along the curve is going to be equal to the unit tangent vector cross product with the rate of change of the unit normal vector with respect to arc length. And uh, what this means is that we can conclude uh, some very important things here uh, because this uh, db hat ds is the, the, or the rate of change of the, the uh, the binormal vector is in fact equal to the cross product of the tangent vector and the, the rate of change of the normal vector we can conclude that the, the following result right we can conclude that um, this db hat ds must be perpendicular to the tangent vector the unit tangent vector and it must be perpendicular it must be per perpendicular to the derivative of the unit normal vector with respect to arc length We'll use that result in a, 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 little, a little bit, but um, using a similar logic to what we did for the, the normal vector last lecture, uh, recall that the length of the binormal vector is equal to 1, because the dot product is equal to 1 with itself, because uh, it's a unit vector. And if we take the derivative of this expression, we end up getting that two b hat prime dotted with b hat is equal to zero. So d b hat ds is in fact also perpendicular to b hat. So what that means, because uh, db hat ds, or the binormal vector, as derivative is perpendicular to both the unit tangent vector and it is perpendicular to the, the unit binormal vector, uh, the only direction in which it can point, it's perpendicular to both t hat and b hat, so the only direction it can point is the, uh, the n hat direction and um, what we do is we, we exactly define this to be the following we, we define it to be tau times n hat And this is the second, actually we'll, we'll label it the third Fresnay formula, and we'll see why in a second. Where tau is what's called the torsion function. which essentially gives us a measure of how much the oscillating plane is oscillating. Um, it's exactly defined as the dot product of this derivative of the binormal vector dot product with 
the normal direction and um, it gives you uh, a measure of how much the oscillating plane is tw twisting uh, along the curve uh, in the, the, the normal direction. Um, so th this is, uh, we have the first two, or I guess the, the, the first and the third Fernet formula. Uh, what we need is the, the, the third and last Fernet Sera formula uh, to get a complete picture of how nice uh, these equations actually are governing uh, any, any nice enough curve in three-dimensional space. So in order to complete this last step, what we can do is we look at, um, well, uh, we know that, remember that the unit normal vector b hat was defined as the cross product of the tangent vector with the normal vector, and these vectors are all orthogonal to one another. So therefore, using our nice property, the cross product, we can actually um, cycle this a few times and uh, we also have that the normal vector will be equal to the cross product of the binormal vector and the tangent vector. This is from our properties of cross product chapter. And we can use this uh, very nice fact to look at obtaining this the last equation, uh, the second Fernet formula, which is for, uh, you know, expression for the derivative of this normal vector with respect to arc length along the curve. And sure enough, this ends up becoming the derivative of the cross product of B with T by virtue of uh, this expression right here. And this becomes then the derivative of the binormal vector with respect to arc length across the unit tangent vector plus the binormal vector cross product with the derivative of the tangent vector with respect to arc length uh, from the product rule for the cross product that we talked about last lecture. And what's nice in the the reason that we started with the first two equations is that this equation reduces as follows. Uh, the last equation, we saw that the derivative of the binormal vector with respect to arc length is just the torsion times the unit normal vector. And we saw that the binormal vector here, so we cross with the derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length, which is just the curvature times the unit normal vector. So we can simplify this a little bit more. So the rate of change of the unit normal vector is going to be this tau times n hat cross t hat. And then it will be kappa, kappa is the curvature, times b hat cross n hat. And um, luckily these things are not too difficult to figure out uh, because we are in an orthonormal frame. Um, so remember the properties of the cross product, if b hat is t hat cross n hat, then n hat cross t hat will be negative t hat cross 
or uh, negative d hat cross n hat or negative b hat um, and same thing with these two expressions right here right um, but b hat cross n hat is now going to be negative t hat this this the final expression that we have is that d n hat ds the rate of change of the unit normal vector is going to be negative kappa times t hat minus tau times b hat and this third equation that we've derived is actually what's called the second Frenet formula and now we'll actually see why this is the nicest way of writing these three formulas So if I take on the next page and copy each one of these formulas that we've derived, You will hopefully see the the beauty of what what it what it is that we've done. So we've clearly, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, shown the following. I'm going to remove the I'll remove the functional dependence here, but remember that both torsion and curvature, so both kappa. So curvature and torsion, tau, are functions of arc length. So they are changing along the curve as you travel on the curve. But what we what we've done is we've uh, derived what's called the frenet sera system of differential equations. On the left hand side are first order derivatives for each one of uh, each one of these has three first order derivatives and the right hand side we just have the, the original the functions themselves mm -hmm. so n hat t hat b hat and n hat uh, along with uh, you know, the curvature function and the, the torsion function tau this is called the Frenet sera formulas or system of ODEs or ordinary differential equations and this is remarkable because this is a system of ordinary differential equations that essentially govern any parametric curve in 3D. Um, if you have the, the curvature function of the curve and the torsion function of the curve that this curve obeys this system of ordinary differential equations um, uh, specifically the 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 Frenet frame obeys the system of differential equations and it is a relatively large system of differential equations because you have three equations here three equations here and three equations here which gives you a total of nine equations but um, it, it is a linear system of ordinary differential equations so um, th this will be an, an interesting thing to look at uh, a little bit later on in the course when we get into systems of ODEs. So how can we uh, use this? Well, I guess the first thing we should look at is uh, if we have a curve that's parameterized by arc length. So consider a curve C that is parameterize
by arc length s So the position vector of the curve is some function, the vector function of s, which is arc length. Recall that we, we've calculated and shown that the unit tangent vector t is just equal to the s derivative of position. The, 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 um, the derivative of position with respect to arc length along the curve and um, we'll use the, the prime notation to simplify this. So prime in this case is going to mean derivative with respect to s just to, to simplify calculations. Furthermore remember that we define the curvature of a curve, the curvature function at any point to be the magnitude of the rate of change of t with respect to s and because t is the the first derivative of our position with respect to arc length this is the same thing as saying that it's the magnitude of the second derivative of position with respect to arc length or just r prime prime for short uh, in this notation. Also recall that we defined the unit normal vector to be the unit vector pointing in the direction of the rate of change of the tangent vector with respect to arc length. which is the same thing as 1 over the curvature function times this derivative or the second derivative of r with respect to s divided by the curvature. What we showed before, that the curvature is just the magnitude of this numerator vector. So in short, n hat, the normal vector, is just r prime prime over the magnitude of r prime prime. you'll remember that r prime prime again the, the double prime here denotes the second derivative with respect to s the uh, the arc length of the curve and lastly we have that b hat or the unit binormal vector was equal to t hat cross n hat which again we can uh, re-express as that it's the first derivative of r with respect to arc length cross the second derivative of r with respect to arc length divided by the magnitude of this vector. So the question is how to find uh, the formula for torsion. It just depends on the, the, the derivatives of R with respect to 
Arc link. S. So we can use all the stuff that we've, we've derived so far, the, um, uh, specifically the Fresnes raw formulas to, to do this. First things first, uh, we consider the Fresnes raw formula, for the, the derivative of the first Fresnes raw formula. Recall that the normal vector, this normal vector, and specifically this, the, 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 the S derivative of the unit tangent vector is equal to the curvature times this unit normal vector. So if we take the second derivative of this expression, or the, uh, the, the S derivative of this expression right here, which is the second derivative of the, the unit uh, tangent vector with respect to arc length, that means that the second derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length along the curve uh, is going to be the derivative of kappa times n hat which will end up being the derivative of kappa times n hat plus kappa times the derivative of the unit normal vector with respect to arc length. That's the, the second derivative of the unit tangent vector with respect to arc length. It's equal to this. And um, we, can, we can go through and, and actually simplify this a little bit more uh, because remember from the, the second fresnes raw formula, this expression right here is equal to we have here kappa prime n hat plus kappa this derivative right here from the second Fresnes raw formula will be negative kappa times t and then minus tau times b this is our first simplification here and then uh, if you recall that uh, we can go through and take the, the, cr the cross product of this entire thing with respect to t hat. It's going to simplify a little bit. And it's going to simplify in the sense that this t hat cross t hat is going to be zero. We can also simplify this a little bit more by noticing that t hat cross n hat is just equal to b hat. and negative t hat cross b hat right here is going to be equal to n hat. So if um, in my last step here I take the dot product of this entire expression with n hat
ln k prime or cap or kappa prime n hat dot product b hat plus kappa tau n hat dot product with n hat and n hat dot with b hat goes to zero because uh, the dot product is zero and n hat is a unit normal vector so this goes to one and what I'm left with is the equation that kappa times tau is equal to the dot product of n hat with t hat across the second derivative t hat or the curvature is equal to this in the numerator divided by the curvature kappa in the denominator. And if you recall from the what we wrote down at the very beginning, um, which is the relationship between the derivative of the position vector with respect to arc length and all of these uh, unit normal vectors, so t hat, n hat, and b hat, we can directly plug in and uh, obtain the following expression. n hat, remember, is the same thing as R double prime over the magnitude of R double prime so it's the dot product of this vector with R prime cross product with this is our triple prime, the third derivative of r with respect to arc length because remember the t hat is r prime or the first derivative of r with respect to arc length so the second derivative of t hat with respect to arc length is actually the third derivative of r with respect to arc length all of this is divided by the magnitude of the second derivative because of this curvature right here. So what we've shown is that the torsion is the second derivative of position with respect to arc length dotted with the first derivative of r with respect to arc length cross product with the third derivative of r with respect to arc length all divided by the magnitude of the second derivative squared or the second derivative dot product with itself. And we've obtained a very nice formula for torsion. And uh, one of the, the key things that we want to note here is that the, the, the torsion specifically depends on all three, you know, the first three derivatives of position with respect to rate of change. So that's the, the first big observation that we want to we want to want to make here. Contrary to um, to the, the the curvature kappa, which we, we have a, the formula from before that kappa, right, the, the the curvature kappa is just the second derivative. This formula right here. Kappa is the second derivative of position with respect to arc length along the curve. Right, so contrary to kappa, the torsion actually depends on the, the third derivative um, of position with respect to arc length. But um, th this is a very nice equation, and um, you know th this essentially gives us a process for calculating uh, the torsion along any curve, um, uh, provided that w the curve is parameterized with respect to arc length. Now we, we could re-express this in terms of a general parameterization. 
So this is, remember, all of these primes here denote the derivative with respect to arc length s. So if we, we need to say, um, you know, do this with respect to a parameter t, so reparameterize, um, we're going to have to uh, do that suitably. You know, our prime drds is the same thing as drdt divided by ds dt or dr dt or v magnitude of the velocity vector so each one of these derivatives would also have to be changed uh, according to this this rule right here so we have to be very very careful um, if you're going to try and do this with respect to a parameterized curve with respect to a different parameter um, uh, so, but it would be a good exercise to go through and do yourself and to kind of see and uh, experiment with. And the last thing that I want to talk about in the lecture today is uh, how to apply the fernese farah formulas to general motion of a solid body. So suppose the following, we'll consider a solid body and the trihedron or the Fernet frame that is frozen into the body. At some point Q in the body. And we'll assume that all right, this frozen frame is moving along some curves. The body is actually in motion along some curve in 3D. We'll start by drawing this. Trajectory. And then we'll say we'll visualize this at some point. Q. This is our solid right here. And you have this point Q inside of the body that's frozen 
where um, it's following this curve C and um, we have the definition of the normal normal vector, the tangent vector, and the binormal vector that remember is, is fixed uh, inside this body on this point Q. And now we will consider another point on the body, we'll call it point P on the body, that's, that's a different point on the body. Maybe let's make this a little bit bigger too, just to sort of illustrate this point. first thing to notice is that from the origin, call it O, over here we have a position vector out to P. Just like we have a position vector out to Q. And we also have a position vector from Q to P. So what we want to consider is um, the, the motion of this body and the, the relative motion of this body and how we can kind of describe that motion and understand that motion. So first off, we'll, we will describe this position vector, the position vector of point P as capital R of T. We'll describe the position vector out to point Q as lowercase r of T. Lowercase r of T is uh, connected to this tangent normal and binormal frame, the Fernet frame, through uh, the formulas that we talked about before. And lastly we'll call, we'll call rho of T the distance between Q and P, the distance out to, to P. So one way of expressing R of T is that R of T is equal to the position of point Q plus row of t and the first thing that we want to notice is that we can make the following uh, simplification because um, t hat n hat and b hat are fixed with respect to the body okay, so they're 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 they're, they're not uh, changing their orientation with respect to the body, this vector rho of t has a very nice expression. We can express rho of t as a constant, rho 1, times the tangent vector as a function of t, plus another constant, rho 2, times the normal vector unit normal vector as a function of t plus the constant row 3 times the binormal vector as a function of t.
let's just make sure that we underline our vectors because that's the notation that we're trying to stick with here. So what that means then is that this vector r of t, capital R of t, is equal to lowercase r of t plus this entire, this summation right here. Row 1 t of t plus row 2 n of t plus row 3 b of 3. And it's really important to point out here that row 1, row 2, and row 3 do not depend on time or on the parameter t. because P and Q are frozen into the body. So even if the body is, is rotating, as it moves along, along the curve, um, these two points are fixed relative to one another. So um, what's really, what's really giving us our um, uh, th th this this c constancy is that is that they're, they're fixed relative to one another so in the the Frenet frame um, uh, the the expansion uh, row 1 times T plus row 2 times n plus row, row 3 times B is always gonna be the same T n and B are going to be changing with respect to time um, but uh, that that's 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 normal and this is going to give us a big simplification because uh, if we want to say figure out the rate of change of the point P with respect to the point Q or dr dt this is going to be equal to this is the the velocity vector of the point P this is equal to the rate of change of r with respect to time, or the parameter t, which is the same thing as the velocity of the vector of the of the, the point q. Plus row one times the rate of change of t hat with respect to t plus row two times the rate of change of n hat with respect to t, plus row three times the rate of change of b hat with respect to t. Or the velocity of the point p is equal to the velocity of the point Q plus this entire sum right here. And recall that um, we have our Frenet Seurat formulas that we can use, uh, but those Frenet Seurat formulas are all relative to the derivative with respect to arc length, not with respect to the, some parameter time or any other parameter. Um, so we have to be a little bit clever here. Um, recall that the derivative of anything with respect to time is going to be the derivative of f's with respect to time times the derivative of e with respect to s. And this is how we have to uh, chain the chain rule. And the chain rule, again, this is how we have to translate our derivatives. 
So we have here the equation that the velocity of the point P is equal to the velocity of the point Q plus rho 1 times, remember here that ds dt is just the velocity of the point Q. In, uh, in magnitude. This is going to be the magnitude of the velocity of the point Q. This is ds dt times dt hat ds plus rho 2 times the velocity of the point Q, because this is ds dt, times dt hat ds, or d, dn hat ds, plus rho 3 times the velocity of the point Q in magnitude, times dp hat ds. Which all simplifies a little bit if we rewrite this as the absolute value of, or the, the magnitude of the velocity of the point q times rho 1 times dt hat ds plus rho 2 times dn hat ds plus rho 3 times db hat ds. And now that we have uh, all of these unit tangent vectors from the Frenet frame uh, and we have the derivatives of them in terms of the arc length s we can go through and apply our Frenet Seurat formulas uh, to get a very nice expression this ends up being a little bit long at first but it will simplify greatly First Frenet Sorrow formula gives us that this is rho 1 times kappa times n the second Frenet Sorrow formula gives us that this d n hat ds is negative kappa t hat negative torsion tau times b hat and the third Frenet formula gives us that db hat ds is just equal to tau times n hat I'll put this in parentheses here but we can go through and directly simplify this equation to look a little bit nicer and then we'll see that it simplifies even greater
So this, this expression simplifies to negative rho two kappa t hat plus rho one kappa plus rho three tau n hat minus rho two tau b hat. And um, it's a good thing to, to, to check this out, get the following uh, expression out, and think about what this is actually equal to. Uh, and sure enough, after, after some thinking, uh, you'll end up seeing that this is equal to the following. It's exactly equal to the magnitude of VQ multiplied by the vector negative tau t hat cross product with kappa b hat. And this is then the cross product with the vector rho. So this, this expression right here is the same thing. As this expression right here. And this is something that you're definitely going to want to go through and check for yourself. Um, it, it's re relatively straightforward to go through and do so. Um, but this is what's going to end up popping out when you go through and do this this cross product. Um, and uh, this is a very, very special vector. This, this vector is a vector that we call the vector omega. It has a very special name. It's called the Darbo vector of the frame. It's a vector that it depends on, uh, you know, the both the torsion and the and the curvature. Um, However, if we rewrite this as using this Darbo vector, we see that the motion of the frame, the formula for the motion of the frame, or specifically for the velocity of the frame, the velocity of the, any point P on this body is uh, uniquely determined and directly determined um, by the, the velocity of the point Q on the curve and of this thing, the, the cross product of the Darbo vector, which is changing with respect to time with a constant vector rho. And uh, the, the main result here is known in kinematic, kinematics of a solid body um, with this, uh, this vector omega uh, called the angular velocity, the, the, the perceived internal angular velocity. So this Darbo vector has a, a fancy name but essentially, uh, this is known in kinematics and physics as the perceived angular velocity of, um, of the solid body. So omega here is, you can think of it like the angular velocity vector, or the perceived internal angular velocity vector at that, that point inside the body. So what's, what's neat here is that our analysis has made it possible to specify this omega uh, as the Darbo vector associated with the trajectory C traced by the point Q of the body 
and it has essentially showed us um, right how uh, you know, to deal with rotational motion in kinematics. This is the correct way of dealing with rotational motion in kinematics. Um, if you have a solid body with fixed points in the body uh, respective to each one of them, you know, one another, uh, this decomposition works out very nicely. And it's a great example of uh, how to apply the Fresnes Serra formulas and how to use the Fresnes Serra formulas in general. But thank you very much for turning into lecture today. I, I, I hope you had a great day and le learned something new.